The 2013 war movie Stalingrad, directed by Fader Bondarchuk, is gritty, exciting, and romantic, and chock full of cutting edge special effects. It's also deeply, deeply immoral, a work of pro war propaganda that marks an inflection point in Russian cinema. Russian filmmakers, and before them, Soviet filmmakers, are part of a long tradition of innovative anti war cinema. That tradition, if not dead, is dying burning up in the same fires of angry nationalism that fuels Russia's wider war on Ukraine. Don't watch the 2013 Russian war movie Stalingrad, but if you do, watch it to understand what's been happening to Russian society, in particular Russian men, to make them crave war, even war they're not likely to win. My name is David Axe, I'm a reporter for Forbes and a longtime freelance contributor to The Daily Beast, Rolling Stone, and other publications. I write books and comics and make weird little movies. And I love Russian war movies. Well, I used to. I loved them because the best of them were deeply anti-war. Now it's impossible to love Russian war movies without also loving war. Stalingrad, the 2013 movie, and yes, there's a reason I keep stressing the date, was directed by Fedor Bondarchuk from a script by Ilya Tilkin and Sergei Shnetskin. It's set in the middle months of the 1942 Battle of Stalingrad. A little history. Stalingrad, now Volgograd, is a city in southwest Russia, 200 miles from Ukraine. In 1942, Stalingrad controlled access to the Volga River and the Caucasus oil fields. For five months, the German army and its allies fought the Soviet army and its allies in the ruins of Stalingrad's factories. Half a million people died on each side, but in the end, the Soviets held the city. The German army was so badly damaged that it never truly recovered, and ultimately lost the war. It's no exaggeration to call Stalingrad the decisive battle of World War II, the European theater at least. For the Soviets, and now the Russians, Stalingrad is a great victory. For the Germans, a great shame. But for both sides, it was an incredible tragedy. All war is suffering but the suffering in Stalingrad was something special. It's hard to kill a million people in one city in five months without nuking it, but the combatants in Stalingrad managed to do just that. Relentless artillery barrages, brutal close quarters firefights, hand-to-hand -hand combat, disease, starvation, execution. To glorify Stalingrad, you absolutely must ignore the reality of Stalingrad. But that's exactly what Bondarchuk does, and there's a very good reason why. 2013 war movie Stalingrad is pro-war propaganda for a state that's desperate to convince millions of Russians, men especially, that war is glorious even when it's terrible. Stalingrad is pro-war propaganda, even if Bondarchuk and his writers didn't mean it to be. Whether the filmmakers were deliberately crafting propaganda or merely reflexively propagating it, they were still doing the work of the state. The plot is simple. It's late 1942 and a Soviet reconnaissance squad is slipping across the Volga in advance of a major counteroffensive. The Soviets hope to capture a German fuel depot in Stalingrad and, from there, roll deeper into the German-occupied city. The scouts' mission is to disable explosives the Germans have rigged to blow the depot in the event the Soviets capture it. But the Germans see the Soviets coming and trigger the explosives before the scouts can cut the wires. In the movie's most memorable scene, Soviet assault troops, lit ablaze by the shower of burning oil, charge German positions while the flames consume them. The scouts and a few other survivors hunker down in a shell-pocked apartment, fight hundreds of Germans, save an attractive young Russian woman, and die to a man in the most awesome ways possible, in slow motion while killing lots of Germans. The flaming assault troops are a big tell. Their deaths are horrifying, yes, but mostly, they're awesome. What men, what heroes, what soldiers, and what an image. The whole movie is like that. The horrors of war portrayed in the coolest way possible. Katya, the Russian woman, is starving, but she's still gorgeous. Our five main characters, Gromov, Chavanov, Nikiforov, Polikiov, Ostikov, all die in battle, but they leave very manly corpses. 
The score swells. Our brave heroes witness some Nazi atrocity in the courtyard and rush out to do battle. The action slows, then speeds up, then slows again. There's leaping and fist fighting and Hong Kong style gun fu. A German bomber doesn't just crash in the courtyard, it crashes in a close tracking shot in expensive slow motion CGI. This isn't war, it's ballet or opera. And the theme of this opera is manhood, Russian manhood, Russian manhood and war. That is, how men make war and war makes men. Sure, they're going to die, but they're going to save the girl and the city and the whole country, and they're going to look great while doing it. If you doubt my reading, consider the character of Ostakov. The scouts find the young artillery officer tied up in the apartment, a prisoner of the Germans. He's a sissy, the scouts say, not just because he got captured, but because he's shy around women, too. His redemptive arc requires him to do two things, kill some Germans and also sleep with Katya. After the scouts pour her a hot bath, of course, and right before the scouts tuck her away somewhere safe. On its face, the 2013 Stalingrad is as much a romance as it is a war movie. It has to be. In modern Russian propaganda, men go to war to save Russia, of course. But that means saving Russia's women, after impregnating them. Manhood and death in war are one and the same. Dying for the women who will birth the next generation of boys, who will die for the next generation of girls, etc., etc. You can see how useful this theme is for the Russian government in 2022 and 2023. The incompetent, undersupplied Russian army lost 100,000 men in just 10 months in Ukraine. Forced conscription helped replenish the ranks, but conscripts don't fight very hard. Volunteers make much better soldiers. And volunteers need a reason to fight besides the cash bonuses the Kremlin offers. What better way to motivate young recruits than to make their manhood contingent on war? Of course, Stalingrad, the 2013 movie, came before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which commenced with the annexation of Crimea in 2014. But the Kremlin, and Russian society as a whole, had been tilting toward war for years. And right after Stalingrad released, quickly doubling its $30 million budget, society tipped. Russian movies marched off to war, then Russia marched off to war. It'd been a long time coming. 97 years ago, in 1925, Sergei Eisenstein made one of the first truly modern war movies, the silent film Battleship Potemkin. It's a profoundly political movie, a celebration of socialism and the Soviet Revolution, but it's also brutally violent and unflinching in its portrayal of civilian suffering. Babies die on screen in Battleship Potemkin. Sixty years later, Elam Klimov battled Soviet censors for nearly a decade so he could shoot Come and See, perhaps the greatest war, that is, anti-war, movie ever made. A boy wanders through the fiery, bloody Nazi occupation of Belarus, seeing and hearing things his young mind can't make sense of. We see only what he sees, hear only what he hears, understand only what he understands. It's war as a psychedelic horror movie, and while it too is political, Germans bad, it manages to convey its politics without ever lying about war or celebrating war. What happened between 1985 and 2013 to make Come and See feel like the end of an era for Russian anti-war filmmakers and the beginning of a new one for pro-war filmmakers? It's not hard to explain. The Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine gained its independence. While Ukraine grew freer and more democratic and closer to the West, Russia grew less free and less democratic and blamed the West and Ukraine for all its problems. It's no accident that modern Russian war movies cast Nazis as the villains, and modern Russian propaganda also blames Nazis for Ukraine's democratic revolution and for the war in Ukraine. There's even a movie about it. In the 2021 Russian war movie Sunbaked, directed by Maxim Brias and Mikhail Wasserbaum, literal Ukrainian Nazis blow up school kids and innocent women in Russian-speaking eastern Ukraine, forcing peace-loving men to join the army to save the women and children the Ukrainian Nazis haven't killed yet. Please note who reportedly financed Sunbaked. Yegevny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, a shadowy Russian mercenary company that oversees a quarter of the Russian forces in the Ukraine war. 
Stalingrad, for all its depravity, at least plays like an action movie if you don't think about it too hard. Sunbaked doesn't even try to be exciting. It's a pro-war movie for a society that's forgotten how to tell the difference between art and propaganda. A society that forgot in part because movies like Stalingrad made forgetting so fun. To appreciate just how wicked the 2013 Stalingrad is, compare it to one of the other movies about the same battle. Compare it to Enemy at the Gates, a French-American production from 2021. Better yet, compare it to German director Joseph Vilsmeyer's 1993 film Stalingrad. The 1993 Stalingrad is an anti-war masterpiece with just enough ties to the 2013 film to really underscore the latter's failures. They even share a lead actor, Thomas Kretschmann, who portrays a German officer in both films. Both focus on a small team of elite soldiers as the apocalyptic battle rages around them. Both films have pretty Russian ladies in them. Both have few survivors. But where the Russian movie makes war look cool, sexy, the German movie is a study in human misery. Consider the young German soldier who, having survived his first bloody battle, practically stares into the camera and moans, I crapped myself. Katya, the love interest in Bondarchuk's movie, smiles sweetly as five brave men fall in love with her, dote on her, protect her, save her. Irina, the uh, love interest in Vilsmeyer's movie, spends much of the movie in a sewer or being sexually assaulted by a German general. She tries to kill herself, but is too scared to pull the trigger. Random friendly fire gets her in the end. The 2013 Stalingrad ends with its biggest and most satisfying battle, a glorious speed-ramped clash that begins with the Soviet scouts literally bouncing their sole artillery shell off the turret of a wrecked German tank in order to shoot around a corner, and ends with the most handsome German and Soviet soldiers dueling with pistols at close range. In the 1993 Stalingrad, the battles begin with no warning and end when everyone's too exhausted and scared to keep fighting. And the clashes get smaller, more barbaric, and less coherent as the movie progresses. Vilsmeyer's film ends with the last two miserable Germans freezing to death on a vast expanse of snow. The German movie steadfastly deprives the audience of any joy. Because there's no joy in war, not really and anyone who tells you there is, is using you. Using you, perhaps, to fight their war for them. How much worse can it get for Russian war movies, you ask? Well, after Russia widened its war in Ukraine starting in February 2022, almost all foreign film financiers pulled out of Russia. That left just one major entity to fund new productions, the Russian government. It's possible, likely even, that whatever war movies Russia makes next will make the 2013 Stalingrad look like the 1993 Stalingrad in comparison. And that's a chilling thought. Okay, honey. Okay, we'll hop up.